And your name? What is your name? Oh, uh, Matt. Matt. Okay, your yeah, name. He's calling Matt. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll give it one more minute or so. How many participants are there? Right now, there are 34. Okay. And I believe the participant number is starting to study out. So let's get started. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Polariton Chemistry Webinars. My name is Matt. I'm a graduate student in the Huel Yuen Zhou Group at University of California, San Diego. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me make a few announcements. So here is the schedule of upcoming talks. Remember the talks are every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of talks. Um, I just wanna point out that we still plan on having webinars um, in the next two weeks on March 3rd and March 10th. However, uh, details are still being figured out. So we will let you know the details as soon as they're figured out. So we also have a Polariton Chemistry Online Community, a public Facebook group. So if you haven't registered already, uh, please do. It's a place where you can share papers, job postings, and more related to Polariton Chemistry. We also have a YouTube channel for this webinar series where we post recordings of webinars so you can watch and rewatch your favorite webinars. If you haven't done so, please subscribe. Next, let's go over the mechanics of the webinar. At the bottom of your screen, there are three options, chat, raise hand, Q&A. During the webinar, uh, you can have discussions with fellow audience members or even with the panelists, me right. and the speaker uh, via the chat, so you can just type it in. And you can also ask questions there. Um, if you wanna ask questions live, just click raise hand, and then I will, at an appropriate time, unmute you, and then you can ask your question. Finally, you can also type questions in the Q&A uh, section. There, uh, the questions will be, those questions will be answered at the end. All right, so now, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Henrik Koch. Professor Koch earned his PhD in theoretical chemistry at Aarhus University in Denmark. He then worked at UNIC Denmark and was a professor at University of Southern Denmark before becoming a full professor at the Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology, NTNU, in 2002. From 2014 to 2016, Professor Koch was a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Since 2018, Professor Koch has held his current positions, full professor at Scuola Normale Superiore and adjunct professor at NTNU. Professor Koch is an expert on electronic structure theory and has contributed extensively to this area since the 
beginning of his scientific career. In particular, his research has focused significantly on modeling intermolecular interactions and calculating molecular response properties. His current research interests include ultrafast core level spectroscopy, using coupled cluster to study non-adiabatic molecular dynamics, and merging quantum chemistry and quantum electrodynamics to model molecular polaritons. Without further ado, uh, Professor Koch, you may now uh, share your screen. Okay, <clears throat> I will try. Okay. This one. <clears throat> and then you see it? Yep. Okay, so I start. Go ahead. So, um, Matt, thank you very much for the invitation. I think that these, uh, these uh, webinars is a great initiative. Today, I will tell you about some of the, the things that we've been working on for the last three years with cavities, especially the, the way that we uh, have approached the development of ab initio methods for molecules in, in cavities. Um, so I am going to first set up the, the, the premise for, for what we're going to do, and then I will tell you about Atrefox theory and coupled cluster theory for, for cavities. And then I will just briefly mention the, the platform, the programming platform that we use, and then I have some illustrative applications of the, the new code. And also, if we have time, I will talk about uh, molecules in chiral cavities that we have recently started to study and uh, are quite excited about. But before I actually get to the, to the business, let me just do the acknowledgements, not to forget it. So th this project really started when Enrico Ronca, he visited me uh, at SNS three years ago. At that time, he was a postdoc with Uncle Rubio in, uh, at Max Planck Institute. And uh, Enrico is now uh, a permanent researcher at the CNR. Um, at the same time that we started uh, Tor, Haukland uh, uh, came along. He was a master student and he was easily persuaded to start this uh, complicated uh, subject. Um, and uh, Erik uh, is uh, a postdoc at uh, NTNU and uh, he is uh, one of the main developers of the, the programming software, uh, the ET program. And then we have uh, Rosario and Laura, they both took their master degree with me um, and they have been working on chiral cavities. And Rosario is now at uh, NTNU as a PhD student and Laura is at the uh, University of Mainz. The QED results I'm going to show you is due to Christian and Ankel. Um, and uh, let me just also thank the other group members uh, at SNS and NGNU, without which it would not be possible to do many of the things that we have done. So there are two key publications here. I will not be able to uh, go through all the details in the development of copper cluster theory for, for polaritons. So you, I suggest that you look in these publications if you're interested. Um, the second paper here is more of an application paper where we applied uh, the theory to intermolecular interactions. Um, so let me set up the premise first. So what we are considering here is uh, we're considering a cavity uh, made up of reflecting mirrors and uh, inside the cavity we have a coupling constant lambda to the radiation field the cavity frequency is determined by the length of the cavity. And if we keep the coupling constant fixed, then we can assume that the, the, the dimension of the cavity is infinite in the two orthogonal directions to the light that we have inside the cavity. The light, the radiation field or the quantum vacuum field that we have in the cavity can interact with the molecules and uh, the, the Hamiltonian that we use to describe this is the minimal coupling Hamiltonian that I have written here in a non-relativistic limit. Um, and this is really our starting point for our business. So the objective is to find the eigen, eigenvalues for this Hamiltonian and the wave functions. So normally this 
Hamiltonian here is the velocity gate. And uh, normally we prefer to use the length gate uh, because of convergence uh, advantages of the expressions. And this, uh, the length gate Hamiltonian is you obtain by doing a unitary transformation of that previous operator here. So they have the same eigenvalues. And it takes this form here. This is the one form that has been advocated by, uh, by Angel and, and his group. And what is really important to recognize here is this self dipole self energy term. Now, you would be tempted sometimes to discard it because it contains the coupling constant squared. But we have to remember that this uh, term actually scales, uh, scales as n squared with the size of the system. So terms from this term here, contributions to the energy can be quite large for large systems. It's also important to note here that this term is important if you want to have a variationally bound uh, operator. So this operator is defined on the Hilbert space that is the full CI space for the electrons and then a direct product with the space for the photons. And uh, the photon space is infinite. Normally, the, the full CI space is, is finite size because we introduce an orbital basis. And then full CI is basically all the possible configurations that we can have distribute the electrons among those orbitals. OK, um, so based on this Hamiltonian, what we want to do now is to do the entry level wave function approximation. And this is Hartree-Fock theory. And we need an, a parameterization of the, uh, the electron photon wave function. So we will take a, a mean field parameterization here, where we have a Hartree-Fock Slater determinant for the electrons, and then a direct product with a photon wave function. Now, as the Hamiltonian is variationally uh, bound from below, we can use the variational principle. And that gives us a condition for the photons uh, and, and uh, an equation for the photons, where we have averaged the Hamiltonian over the, the Hartree-Fock state. So the, this average Hamiltonian is the Hartree-Fock energy, the electronic contribution to the Hartree-Fock energy, plus several other terms. And then again, we identify this uh, self uh, dipole self energy term. And this term here that we have here is the bilinear term, we call it. Now, this Hamiltonian is purely uh, photonic, and it can be diagonalized exactly uh, using coherent state uh, transformations. And I've written that here, uh, where the set parameters in the coherent state transformation are given by this expression. Uh, the number of photons in, in a coherent state uh, is equal to the square of the set parameter. And so we see that the number of photons, uh, yeah, it scales as the inverse of the, of the uh, cavity frequency. One thing I want to point out here is that it is well known for, for many of you, maybe, that in electronic structure theory, we have a size extensivity problem for some methods like configuration interaction. And actually, this. Uh, wave function here I've written for the photons shows that we can also have the same problem in the photon space if we choose to write photon wave functions as linear parameterizations. This is, uh, the, the, this wave function here is uh, size extensive. It's just the exponential product of the coherent states. And so it, it behaves correctly for this Hamiltonian. But we should be aware of this when we actually want to uh, construct a uh, a full parameterization of the electron photon wave function. Now, we don't want to carry around these uh, p states for the photons. So what we prefer is to change the Hamiltonian. So we just transfer this, this unitary transformation to the Hamiltonian, and then we use a reference state, which is the Hartree-Fock state, and then the photon back. Now, this gives a very nice uh, Hamiltonian that explicitly uh, shows the, the the origin invariance of the Hamiltonian. So the D operator here is the dipole operator. It also contains the contribution from the, from the nuclei. So for a neutral molecule, the, the dipole moment is origin invariant. However, for charged molecules, the dipole moment changes. But as we can see that we subtract the average value here over the electronic part, 
for instance, the Hartree Fock, then we see that this is origin invariant. And this is both for the self uh, energy term and also for the bilinear term. Now, with this, we can then calculate the QED Hartree Fock energy. It's simply given by this expression here. It's the normal expression for the Hartree Fock energy plus this, this dipole self energy term. Now, it is fairly easy to show that this actually is size extensive, even though that we have a square here. So you initially you wouldn't expect it to be size extensive, this term, but it turns out that when you have a product wave function uh, in Hartree Fock, then it becomes uh, size extensive and the energy becomes additive for two spatially separated molecules. This also means that Hartree Fock is not able to describe this long range interaction correlation between molecules that you obtain via the cavity modes or the modes inside the cavity. Now, when you have defined the Hartree Fock energy, then it's normal that we proceed in quantum chemistry to define a molecular orbital theory, which gives us sort of a, a zero order entry model in order to understand chemistry. It turns out that in, uh, yeah, in this case, Professor? Yes? Uh, we have a question in the chat. Okay. Uh, so it's from Eric Fisher. And mm -hmm. the question is, does the QED Hartree Fock Hamiltonian depend on the reference structure of the molecule through the nuclear contribution of the dipole moment? No, so this, this is, um, okay, I didn't mention this, but this is the born Oppenheimer Hamiltonian, right? So uh, this is the born Oppenheimer approximation. But it is normal to include this, this, uh, this dipole contributions to the nuclei in the dipole moment. There is a separate Hamiltonian for the, for the motion of the nuclei. I hope that answers the question. Okay, should I proceed? Yes, please. Yep, he, he says you okay. answered the question. Yep. Okay, so wh what I said here was that, uh, so now let's uh, use this Hartree Fock energy and then we calculate the Fock matrix. If in the standard way that we normally do, we take the derivative with respect to the densities and then we get a, a standard Fock matrix. The problem with this Fock matrix that we obtain in this way is that it's origin dependent when the molecules are charged. And the reason for this is that you can see here, I. I write up the, what happens to the Fock matrix when we displace a charged molecule inside the cavity. The delta D here is the change in the dipole moment due to the, the change of the, the position of the, of the molecule inside the cavity. And you see that what changes in this matrix is the occupied orbital part. So the IJ here labels occupied orbitals and the AB labels uh, virtual orbitals. But you see that the occupied part changes differently than the virtual part. We have plus signs here and yeah, so they, there is different changes here. This means that, for instance, the homolumo gap between uh, for charged molecules would change as you change the origin. We also see that the off-diagonal elements do not change. And this means actually that this uh, Hartree Fock energy is origin invariant, no problem. It's just that our interpretation, uh, this Fock matrix here is not appropriate. So we cannot, based on this Fock matrix, uh, formulate a molecular orbital theory. Neither do we have a Koopman's theorem because the ionization potential would, uh, depends on where we place the molecule. And it's, of course, also a problem when we want to do perturbation theory, because in perturbation theory, you, um, you normally uh, have to choose a zero order operator. And if the zero order, order operator is origin dependent, then you, you will have uh, strange behavior of the perturbation theories. Now, what you could say, of course, is that, well, you only do calculations for uh, neutral molecules, and then you are safe. But it actually turns out that the Fock matrix here also have other problems that I'm not going to talk about today. But um, you could also have chosen to do perturbation theory only using the electronic Fock matrix. Of course, this is possible, but then you don't really have a molecular orbital theory that treats the cavity to infinite order. Okay, but now we have sort of created the, the Hartree-Fock approximation 
which is the starting point for doing electron correlation and electron photon correlation. So let me just give you uh, just a short, very short overview of what copper cluster theory is for those of you that don't know it. The copper cluster wave function is parameterized in terms of the Hartree Fox state. So this is just for electrons, right? Uh, and then in terms of an exponential parameterization in terms of single excitations, double excitations, and so on from this Hartree Fox state. And uh, in the case when you include all possible excitations, this is equivalent to the full CI. We cannot use the variational principle with this wave function. So we, what we do is that we project the Soidinger equation onto a subspace, and then we solve the equations in that subspace. Of course, when the subspace is complete, then we have full CI. This gives us an energy, and it gives us a set of equations that needs to be solved. And excited states we get from the the a Jacobian matrix that is has this expression here, the eigenvalues of this matrix corresponds to the excitation energies of the system. And the eigenvectors, of course, gives us the excited state wave functions. So we can maybe look at these in a little bit slightly different way. Uh, and I think this is quite useful to remember, is that the, those equations are completely equivalent with looking at a CI problem for a similarity transformed Hamiltonian. So when this transformation is analytical, then H bar has the same eigenvalues as my original Hamiltonian. And so I might as well use this one if it's an advantage. And you see here, I have written up the CI matrix. You have the ground state energy here. And from this, you see that what we add on here is exactly the, the excitation energies, the eigenvalues of A. What is noteworthy for the copper cluster is that it is size extensive, means that energies are additive, and it's size intensive, it means that excitation energies do not depend on size. However, these two properties we're going to lose when we put the molecule into the cavity. So let's proceed to the cavity because the QEDCC is mainly a, a it's, it's a rather simple generalization of the, of the copper cluster for electrons. The wave function is parameterized exactly in the same way, but now this reference state is now the direct product of the hartree fock and the photon state that I mentioned before. Um, also, the, the copper cluster operator will now be different. The, the cluster operator will be different. And there is possible uh, choices you can make here when you want to choose this cluster operator. For instance, uh, uh, one of the criteria that we have put on when we chose the, the operator manifold to span the, the operator is that we would like to have all operators that commute. So the choice that we have done, taken, is uh, all operators commute with each other. And this makes it rather simple to derive the, the expressions. And at the same time, we don't really sacrifice anything because we, we can systematically increase the, the, the accuracy by including more and more uh, uh, excitations all the way to the full CI limit or the exact limit. So the operators looks like this. We have the electronic part. This is identical to copper cluster for electrons. Then we have a purely photonic part that is given here as uh, different boson operators. We create different bosons. So in the simplest case, the simplest operator here just has one, one creation operator for the photon. And then we have the interaction term, which is really the combination of the electronic and the photonic operators. So for instance, S1N could be the a single excitation for the electron and then the creation of one photon. Now for the excited states, what we get is that we get an enlarged uh, Jacobian matrix that needs to be diagonalized to get the excited states. This matrix here, this part here, the EE for electrons, is the one that we have if we only have electrons. But we have to include all the other coupling blocks when we have uh, photons as well. Um, now, in our, this basically sets out a general formalism for how to, to solve the, 
for, for formulate uh, cluster theory for, for cavities. We have not, our, well, I should say, our initial implementation of this, we have looked at singles and double excitations for the electrons and then a one photon model. This actually means that the, the cluster operator is a T1 and T2 operator for electrons. Then it's a T1 and T2 for electrons coupled with one photon, and then we have one photon operator. You should also note that the scaling of QED CCSD1 is the same as CCSD for electrons. And there is a prefactor because we have increased the number of amplitudes here in the operator, right? Uh, of, of about two to three. We also have a full CI code for photons and electrons. This we call QED FCF, uh, FCI. Um, however, it's very restricted to what systems we can actually use this for because uh, FCI scales uh, factorially with the size, with the number of electrons and the number of orbitals. Okay. So let me just uh, briefly mention uh, where we have implemented this stuff. We have developed over the, the recent years, we have developed a new program system that's called ET. Um, and this is open source. So you can just head to this uh, website here, uh, etprog.org. And then you, can, uh, then you can download for free. All the, our QED codes will be released in this package. And uh, I just want to mention one functionality. I don't want to go into details about this. Uh, but what we have, uh, the special functionality I would like to mention is the multi-level functionality. So we have the functionality to localize the electron density into different regions of space and then uh, apply different levels of uh, correlation to the different regions of space. So if you have a phenomenon that you want to study that is rather localized to a certain region of the molecule and you want high accuracy, then you can apply a higher accuracy method in this region and then a lower accuracy in other regions. And we can also have more regions. That is no problem. On the left here is shown those occupied orbitals that go into this uh, density here, the lead density. So our mission is clear that we want to uh, develop QED methods for this kind of, the, for the multi-level uh, hierarchy of methods so that we have flexibility to actually look at rather large systems inside the cavity. Okay, but let me now uh, uh, shift to some uh, uh, illustrative applications. The first one I will look at is um, PNA. Uh, and PNA uh, has a very strong charge transfer and excitation. Um, and exactly what we want to have from the Hamiltonian is that we want to have a transition that gives a large change in the dipole moment. And this is also what we see here for PNA. This is a, a frequency dispersion plot. So here we have the cavity frequency and here's the excitation energy in the molecule. Here we have the different uh, excited states uh, in, the, in the system. And here we have the one photon line from the ground state. So this is basically the ground state with one photon. And then we get the typical Rabi split in here. We get a lower polariton, we get an upper polariton. And uh, it's quite large here, right? It's around one electron volt. So this is probably, uh, in the ultra strong coupling limit, the coupling constant here was, a, was 0 0.05. Um, uh, but what is new really is not these dispersion plots. What is new with the couple cluster method is that now we can actually start to explore the potential energy surfaces of the lower and the upper polarotrons and see how they, we can change the chemistry using these states uh, in photochemistry, for instance, if we excite the molecule to these states. Another example we would like to show is that we can actually lift uh, the degeneracies uh, at conical intersections. So for that purpose, uh, we have looked at Purold here, and we have looked at the stretching of the, the NH bond and I have this plot here without the cavity, lambda equals zero. We have the ground state, we have the two excited states here, 
And what I'm interested in is this crossing between the ground state and, uh, uh, and the excited state. Now, this is a different symmetry conical intersection that we have here, so there is no problem with, uh, with, the, with uh, those crossings there. But once we put it in the cavity, uh, this degeneracy between the ground state and uh, the excited state is actually lifted. And this shows that uh, the cavity can, can, can uh, lift uh, the, these degeneracies. I should also point out that the example we had here with PNA, the important term in the Hamiltonian for this splitting is the bilinear term. In the case of the pyrrole and the lifting of the, the, the conical intersection here, uh, the degeneracy, it's the dipole self energy term that's responsible, that is mainly responsible for, for that, uh, that effect. Let me now look at uh, some other uh, examples I have here. Uncle spoke about the dipole induced dipole last week. So I'm going to mention Van der Waals and hydrogen bonding today. Uh, professor, yes. we have a question from the audience. Uh, hi, sorry, I have a question. Uh, when you say that the conical intersection is lifted, is it just shifted in nuclear configuration or is it actually eliminated in your case? Yeah, this, the, uh, oh, no, uh, the, well, I cannot, uh, we don't know for sure, right? We, we only know that we did this uh, one dimensional scan and uh, from that, uh, that we saw that it would, was lifted. We have to explore the, the potential energy surface around that area in order to actually understand if we have just moved the conical intersection to another place or, or uh, what has happened. This only demonstrates that, that we have lifted the degeneracy in this specific point. Okay. So much more studies is needed in order to actually understand what, what is actually happening. My understanding based on uh, other studies on laser control of conical intersections is that it's very unlikely to remove conical intersections, but rather just to shift them in position. But uh, I don't really have very good intuition about what- No, I, of course, I also think so, because you have many degrees of freedom here that yeah. you could actually change, right? So. Uh, and we know that uh, just from looking at the, the Hamiltonian, that uh, the conical intersection scene is uh, in minus two dimension. So in principle, there, there, there is uh, conical intersections other places, but maybe that they look very different from, uh, from this one, right? So, yeah, but I'm really, really I, I come to, uh, I can't really give a definitive answer here because we still have to do a lot of calculation and exploration of it. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question. Okay. So can you tell me the major advantage of doing couple cluster in this electron photon, you know, hybridized Huber space versus a much naive way, which is you just use couple cluster to solve energies dipoles of an isolated molecule and just plug in those values into your, your, your QED Hamiltonian. You solve that with you know, certain number of flux state by direct diagonalization. Because by doing that, you avoid the approximation you're going to introduce for the cluster excitation in the, in the flux states, right? You, I, I assume you're going to truncate to you know, single or, or double or triple excitation, right? Yeah, but um, uh, I of course, you could you could do that. To me, it sounds uh, a little bit like a perturbation approach, right? Where, where you you use the you use the, the the zero order states, which is just the electronic, and then you incorporate uh, the, the the cavity perturbationally, right? And uh, I think what is what what you could be missing there is actually the strong interaction, uh, the strong electron. Uh, photon correlation. I will show you an example now that we, we get to the, the front of us that uh, there are interactions there that are completely due to the electron photon correlation. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's important to, um, to include um, those effects. 
I see. Uh, especially when you have strong coupling. It could be, of course, in the in the weak coupling limit that uh, you should get uh, you get reasonable results. But I'm not advocating say you know you 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 include the influence of the photon field perturbatively. I'm advocating just you know solving part of the Hamiltonian uh, through electronic structure, right? And then pairing with the basis of another part, which is photon, and directly diagonalize the whole Hamiltonian. That should include all the orders of you know the perturbation, quote unquote, um, as you said. So it should be in well, principle equivalent. The basis equivalent. becomes complete. I completely agree with you, right? I completely so agree. Are in, but we in couple cluster in this electron phonon hybrid Hilbert space. The, you, you, the, the size of the bases will be much smaller compared to what I just described. Is that right? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, we have twice as many parameters, right? So, uh, so it's a factor of two, a factor of two to three. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let me let me uh, move on here to the the, the, the van der Waals, um, and uh, this is a, a kind of busy slide. So this uh, shows the the interaction energy of two hydrogen molecules inside the cavity. We have chosen two different polarization directions: one along the the, the H two bond and one along the intermolecular uh, uh, axis. Um, and we have uh, quite a number of colors here. The red is couple cluster, the black is full CI, and the, the punctured line here is without the cavity. Right? And we see that CCSD is fairly accurate compared to full CI. We actually know that we need to add triples here to get a really good agreement, but uh, there is a, a pretty good agreement with the, with the CCSD. What is interesting now is the cavity effects. So you see that the polarization direction uh, along the, the X actually deepens the well uh, quite significantly compared to without the cavity. And if we have it in the set direction along the intermolecular bond here, then we decrease the, the interaction energy. So this interaction energy is due to electron correlation. Um, and the, the change between these is mainly due to electron photon correlation. We see that if we look at uh, Hartree Fock and the QED Hartree Fock methods, um, we see that they are not able to capture this correlation. And this is actually also well known for, at least for, for, for DFT and also Hartree Fock, that dispersion interaction between molecules is a very difficult thing to, to describe, uh, even without the cavity. But the next plot is quite interesting because here what we have done is that we have plotted in red for different uh, polarizations the induced cavity effects. So this is the QED a couple cluster minus couple cluster. And then we get these, these are the, the cavity effects, right, directly. And what is interesting is that they fall off or they are described as an R to the minus three term, which is typical for what we would uh, call dipole-dipole interaction. However, the, the interaction cannot be described by a dipole, in, dipole interaction. If we put the H2 molecule in the cavity, the, 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 the dipole moment, uh, the electronic dipole moment is, is almost still zero. And uh, so we cannot describe this effect by uh, electrostatics. So it's a pure quantum interaction between described by the electron photon interaction. And it's very different from the normal uh, London interaction, right? R to the minus, minus six, which the, the correlation energy displays. Um, let me look at another case here um, that uh, is the water dimer. The water dimer is, of course, a dipole dipole interaction, but there is also some charge transfer uh, contributions to the interaction. 
And here we see that uh, we have CCSD here, and here we have QED CCSD, and we see there is a significant cavity effect on the binding energy between them. Uh, it seems that Hartree Fock and QED Hartree Fock are not able to describe the same degree of uh, of interaction. And I think this has to do with the fact that there are some uh, electron photon correlation missing in those in the in the in the functionals. But of course, it will be very interesting to use this information about the behavior of the QED effects to develop new functionals for for uh, improved functionals for QED. Now for DFT, uh, QEDFT. There is another effect here that is very interesting, and this has to do with the size extensivity. So because of this dipole self-energy term in the Hamiltonian, um, the, the, model, the, the interaction of molecules is no longer size extensive. So it is not additive. And this we have, can see here, um, we have done several calculations for on water molecules that are separated by 200 Ohmstrom. And then we have calculated the interaction energy. And you can see that there is an n squared dependence on the interaction energy. The Hartree Fock model, well, like I said before, is size extensive. So that is simply additive. Um, now I would like to maybe what, how, how are we doing with the time? Uh, we have like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, I would say. What? Okay, I think I can do kind of cavities. And before so you move on, uh, we have a qu some questions in the the chat. So they're from Arkadit Mandel. So the question is: In this dimer molecule, do you include the cross dipole self energy, the dipole self energy that couples two molecules? Yes. And do you yeah. observe any constellation between electrostatic dipole? Dipole interaction and cross dipole interaction? Uh, I don't know. I don't think now we haven't looked at that actually. So I, I, I can't answer you there. But maybe you can send me the question, then we will have a look. Oh, you, you actually have access to the question in the chat? Okay, okay. So maybe I can then, um, yeah, can answer it. So. Okay. So let me get on with the- uh, Actually, the, there's one more qu question, if you don't mind answering, or if you want, we can wait till later. But uh, there's another question. Would you like to answer? Okay, let's see. Yeah, yeah it's from Tao Lee. Uh, is, that is it possible to do QED HF and QED CC using Coulomb gauge? If you include all? No, wait, I didn't hear. Oh, is it is it possible to do QED HF and QED CC using Coulomb gauge. But we are using Coulomb gauge. So then the Hamiltonian is derived in Coulomb gauge. So I don't know specifically what you are thinking about there. So maybe we should, uh, we can chat about that. So maybe Coulomb gauge is not, uh, you mean something different, but the Hamiltonian is derived in Coulomb. Okay, so should I continue? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so molecules in chiral uh, cavities. So recently they have um, been able to fabricate uh, cavities where uh, the mirrors in the cavity preserves the handedness of light and only reflects uh, either left or right uh, polarized light. And they can even control which uh, polarization direction that you, you, you get. They can switch between the polarization direction uh, using temperature control. So you can have a look at this paper from, from last year. But what is interesting here with the chiral cavities is that, so we have a certain polarization of the photons inside the cavity. And if I have a chiral molecule there, and I do a reflection of the whole system. Then I change the polarization of the cavity and I change the molecule. So I would not expect any change if I change the, the 
the enantiomere at the same time as I change the polarization of the cavity. But if I just keep the same enantiomere and I change the polarization, then there will be a difference. And this is the one that we have uh, been exploring, exploring recently. And now, <clears throat> we, of course, we need to generalize the Hamiltonian in this case. And uh, uh, the vector potential gets more general. The polarization directions for the left and right polarized light become complex. But this is not enough. We cannot just use this and the dipole approximation, then we don't see anything. So we need to go beyond the dipole approximation. So in this case, the vector potential looks like this. And then we have the, the minimal coupling Hamiltonian here. And then we use a rather standard procedure here. We do, uh, we do a, a P set W transformation, and then we do a multiple expansion uh, with respect to the center of charge. This ensures us an origin invariance of the results, but we still have a dependence on the center of charge. And what we have done here initially is that we have explored this using QED Hartree-Fock. What was rather surprising to us is that we get a sort of uh, homochirality inside the, inside the cavity. It turns out that it seems that molecules that, that, uh, that rotate light uh, in the same direction as the cavity polarization are stabilized more than those that, that uh, rotate in the other direction, the other in Algeria. And this we have um, explored here. And let me just show you this one example here. Here is a, a molecule, uh, serine, it's left serine. Uh, the cavity dimension is like this. And uh, these are off resonance uh, calculations, right? So uh, the cavity frequency is 270 electron volts. Um, so we place this serine inside the cavity and then uh, we have left and right polarized cavity light, and then we uh, there is a strong uh, uh, orientational effect inside the cavity of the molecule, and so uh, these are the two other uh, uh, rotation directions than the rotation uh, uh, around the, the k vector is invariant, so the energy doesn't change there. But the two other directions is the ones that I showed you here. And then we get an energy landscape for the molecule inside the cavity. And the same for the right uh, polarized cavity, but it's still left serine that's inside the cavity. And then you can actually see that there are differences in this landscape, right? That the minima look different uh, and uh, the maxima too. So what I have over here is the energy difference. So it's left minus right. And you see there are large differences, changes in the, in, the, in the landscape. And if we look at the minima here, so there are two equivalent minima uh, for the L cavity, and then there are two equivalent minima for the R cavity, but they are actually located in different positions. And the L cavity here has a lower energy than the R cavity. And so it seems that cavities will favor one in antiomer over the other. So this is, has been very exciting to, to start looking at this. But what we really would like to, to, to calculate is some kind of spectroscopic fingerprint. So uh, Professor, we, have, huh? uh, we have a question okay. from the audience. Yeah, hello. Um, I just have a question regarding the parameters of your cavity here. Uh, is, is it a dipole or omega C is really 272 EV? Yes, so you, you, it, uh, it, it corresponds to the, to, the, to the length of the cavity, right? So uh, yeah, this is the, the, the cavity frequency that we choose. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you very much. So of course, it's a very small cavity, right? So uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, here I have a, a larger cavity. Uh, so this is thalidomide. So what I was just saying before is that we would like to find a spectroscopic uh, fingerprint that uh, could actually be tested experimentally. 
So what we did, you look at, you see these potential energy surfaces here. So what we have done is that we have uh, we have solved, uh, we have diagonalized the rotational Hamiltonian uh, with this surface here in order to get the rotational states, and then we have calculated the spectrum from the, from those states. Um, and this for thalidomide, this gives us this uh, this plot uh, of the, the different spectra. You see that for left and right polarized light, we have some of them are very um, close, but actually this low one here has a significant splitting. One, one should uh, be careful here, I should be, because um, you see the energies here are in inverse centimeters. And this is a very large energy for rotational, for rotational levels. Uh, and we would probably have coupling to the vibrational modes in the molecules as well. So this means that if the, we had to do a, a, a really consistent uh, consideration here, we, we should probably have solved both the rotational and the vibrational problem at the same time. Uh, but at least this, this study here, because it probes the whole potential energy surface, uh, gives us an, an indication that there should be differences and they should be observable differences between having a left or right polarized uh, cavities. Another thing that could be very interesting, of course, is, uh, is the, the possibility of making in angioselective uh, synthesis and for that purpose, we have uh, studied a simple model system where we have a methoxy ion here and then we have a set aldehyde here. And they react to give something that is called a hemiacetals. I'm not an organic chemist, so I'm not very uh, well, uh, well acquainted with the different names of molecules. But the, the fact here is that in this configuration that we have arranged here is that when the the methoxy ion approaches the, the acetal acetaldehyde uh, from above here. Then we get an R uh, configuration. And when it comes from below, we get an S configuration. And so, uh, or R and L, I should say, maybe. So when, in the case that we are at 90 degrees, there is no chirality of the system. The, it's not chiral anymore. So we have these two extreme points. And what we have calculated then is, uh, is the energy differences um, for, uh, for this plot here. And what we can see is that when we have them in zero position, then, and I have left polarized cavity, then the energy is higher than if I have them at 180 degrees and, uh, and still have a left uh, cavity. So we have the, the sort of a, a bias through uh, one direction, right, to the, to the R as compared to the left. Um, we also see here that if we try to do this in the dipole approximation, the blue curve here, then there is no effect of the, the we can't see any difference between the two, the, the two uh, polarizations. Um, but okay, I should say that we haven't published these results yet because we still have some, some work to do. Um, we should look at uh, uh, the, the dependence uh, in the Hamiltonian of the expansion point. And we have some uh, nice ideas for that, but I can't tell you about it now. Uh, also, we um, have to look at the effect of electron correlation and electron photon correlation on these numbers. And then, of course, if we want actually to show that, that there, there could be some in an antiomeric excess then we need to run some molecular dynamic simulations and actually run several uh, trajectories and in order to, to show any statistical, statistical significance um, of, the, of, the, of the excess. And of course, there's also the, the experimental side of this. We are very keen on working with the experimentalists that, that might be willing to try and actually 
observe this phenomenon. So now I will wrap up um, and with my conclusions. And so I hope I have convinced you that uh, cavity quantum chemistry actually offers many new possibilities for modeling in polyatonic chemistry. What we are aiming at is quantitative accuracy in predictions rather than qualitative observations. Um, it's also clear to me that modeling is important in order to give directions to the experimental practice of uh, polyatonic chemistry. But on the other hand, it's also important for the theorists to take input from the experimentalists and actually uh, learn something about uh, our, the accuracy of our methods and models. And what would be really nice if there is any experimentalist that can do high resolution gas phase spectroscopy of molecules in cavity. It doesn't really matter what energy range you're looking at, any uh, high resolution uh, experiment, uh, experiments would be helpful in order to assess uh, the, the accuracy of the model hand tools that we're using. And then, of course, I should also thank uh, those that paid for it all and made it possible. And then uh, thank you for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Professor, for a nice talk. Uh, so let's address some of the questions typed in. So uh, do you see the chat, Professor? Uh, let me just, uh, how do I, I exit the presentation? No, uh, on the bottom of your screen or on the top of your screen, you'll see a window, a button that says chat. Uh, Next to the share screen button. Ah, uh, there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I can read it out loud. I just wanted you to see it because there's a it's a long question. So, uh, Tali wanted to follow up on his question from before. So, yes. I mean, can we directly work in the Coulomb gauge without gauge transform? Your work starts from Coulomb gauge, but then does a PWZ transform and works in the dipole gauge. This is because calculations under different gauges sometimes may lead to inconsistent eigenvalues when full CI is not used, which is the usual situation for electronic structure calculations. Therefore, it will be very nice if PVD electronic structure calculations can be run in both Coulomb and dipole gauges. Um. Yeah, but let, okay, I'm just a little bit um, uncertain what you mean by Coulomb gates, but do you mean the velocity uh, expression then? This is the thing. I, I don't really understand what, what, what is being asked, but of course we can, in principle, run with in velocity gates. That, that, that is absolutely no problem. Just have to uh, use that Hamiltonian and, uh, and derive those, those terms. I do expect that you might need uh, more photons in order to get the same accuracy. Of course, in the exact limit, the Hamiltonians give the same eigenvalues. But it could be that, uh, that in the velocity gates that you need to add more photons uh, to your correlation problem to, to get the same solutions. But then actually, the, we have not had these tools available for so long. So I expect that uh, in the future, we will be able to do some, some detailed comparisons of, con uh, of convergences of the different uh, formulas and so on. Okay, cool. So we have another question. Uh, it's in the Q&A from Andrew Salid. The question is, what is the origin of the difference between the energies of the orthogonal polarizations X and Y? I, if I'm guessing there is, this question relates to your previous results yes. on the dimers or the first project where you varied the polarization? Yeah, this is, um, let me go back there. I think I can go back here. Was it this one here? I, I believe so. Yeah, well, um, the, there has, of course, something to do with symmetry in this case, right? So uh, I think that uh, uh, the symmetry of the molecule is important here. Uh, so you have a, a D infinity H molecule. And uh, uh, so I, I think that 
this this certainly has something to do with it. Um, I I can't really uh, nail it down any closer for now. Um, to um, um, no, uh, yeah, I, I I don't think I want to answer more because I, I don't really. So it's going to be a pure speculation for me. So I I don't I prefer not to say anything. Okay, so now let's get to some questions, some live questions. So, hi, um, I have a question about uh, the case where you put chiral molecules inside chiral cavities, and you plot mm -hmm. the energy as a function of theta and phi. Um, yes. So, in that case, is theta and phi the orientation of the molecule? I... Not this one. The one uh, I think twenty-two, maybe slide. This one. Yeah, this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you uh, you basically you you keep uh, K fixed and then you you rotate the molecule. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would expect that in a regular cavity uh, there should be no change with phi, right? Like once you fix theta and you rotate it about phi. Now, if you rotate a, a, around K, then then there is is no problem, right? Then it's invariant. Yeah. But then you have two other angles, right? To rotate. And those are the two ones that I, I, I plot for you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next question. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so I have a question about the last slide where you had that. Uh, when you approached by a meth methoxy thing with uh, various angles so so mm -hmm. from 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 basic organic chemistry um we have these um, so when we have a nucleophile at attack to a carbonyl uh, we have a like we have something called a burgit donate trajectory where like they have they have a, they have a specific path where there is maximum overlap of the lumo of the nucleophile with the homo of the molecule or otherwise something like that so i see that angle shift Towards one side, when there is like uh, one type of cavity, one like left polarized, light polarized. So does that mean that the orbitals of the carbonyl are actually skewed towards skewed towards a different phi angle, or say towards one side, so such that the maximum overlap path actually changes? No. So the the way way that I I. I... I view this right is that uh, you have uh, two energy landscapes. So let's keep the the, the 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 polarization fixed, right? And then if you are here at ninety degrees, there is no difference, right? They they are giving the same value, the two polarizations. But then you have a, a difference in energy. So uh, going to, uh, from yeah, in this case here, and if we had the red then going to the right would be lower in energy than going to, to the left, right? or going down or going up. I don't know how. So this is, this, this is the way that I, uh, I view it. We, we fix the, polariz the polarization of the cavity, and then we induce a preference energetically to have either uh, R or L. I see. Okay. Uh, but of course, the, the the orbitals in the in the in the molecules change because we have interaction between the between the photon and uh, and uh, the electrons. Okay. Okay. So so yeah, I found that interesting because uh, like based on the polarization of the photon, um, I feel the orbitals change in orientation in a specific way. Like based on the if I give you the polarization of light, I think. We must be able to, able to say like in which way the orbitals are skewed. So that, that's what I found interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, that that you would be able probably be able to see that uh, from the from the orbitals in the in that comes out of the Hartree-Fock calculation. We haven't looked at that uh, to be quite honest, but this could be quite interesting to see how the the orbitals change. Uh, depending on the orientation. This is a very fixed uh, system, right? There's nothing um, realistic about this model system because uh, where, is the, where is the solvent? We don't have any solvent here, right? So it's, uh, 
it's a very minimalistic model that, that we have just tried out here initially. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. All right, so we have two more questions. Uh, next question. Uh, hi, uh, I'm still confused about uh, the statement that you need a cavity of 270 electron volts uh, to see these effects. Okay, so I understand that this is because you really want to have a very small mode volume and you are assuming a fabric perot cavity. However, uh, can you elaborate on um, what is the role of the excited of the of the photonic excitations in this? in this effect because yeah. these, are, these are all ultra strong coupling effects, right? Like these are ground state effects that you are seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the thing is that we, in those calculations here, we have kept the coupling uh, at a reasonable level, and then we have uh, adjusted the size of the cavity. Wait, but then, but then I still don't understand this, but then um, are there any conditions of resonance between the 270? Oh, resonance, it's completely off resonant. Or, uh, all the effects that we are we are observing here for the for the chiral cavity is due to the uh, dipole self energy times. I see. Mainly, I, I wouldn't say that it's exclusively, but uh, this is mainly due to the dipole self energy times. Well, not dipole self energy times because we get corrections right from the from the, the higher orders in the multiple expansion. So but should I think from, about... Uh, terms that are similar to, to dipole uh, interaction terms. So experimentally, what would you really tell, like, um, wh what, is the, what is the system you really are thinking about, like a nanoplasmonic object of, a, of the same size, something like that? Yeah, I think that it could maybe just be interesting to, to um, to look at, um, I know that gas phase is probably out of the question. So uh, uh, maybe just to look at some uh, some uh, chiral uh, mirrors uh, that you you sandwich, and then you have uh, some uh, chiral species in between the mirrors. Okay, but then I, I would say then the physics would change a lot because then you would need many molecules in that case, but uh, which I think is related to the question that is in the chat uh, that I don't know, maybe Matt can, uh, can, 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 can read, but, but I think it makes sense to me. Thank you very much. Okay, so actually, uh, yeah, I will address the question in the chat. So it's from Claudia Clement. Single molecule strong coupling cannot be achieved with every pro cavities. How do you plan to tackle many molecule strong coupling with these QED methods? Yeah, but um, I think now I just need to see the Q and A. Oh, the question is in the chat. No, I don't see it in the chat. No, no. Where was the question? Oh, it's at towards the end of the chat. If you the third to last comment in the chat. Uh, can, you, um, can you read it to me again? Sorry. I Certainly. Read. So the question is, single molecule strong coupling cannot be achieved with heavy pro cavities. How do you plan to tackle many molecule strong coupling with these QED methods? Okay, but that is, uh, this is exactly what, what uh, we would like to do, why we want to, to develop the, the multi-level methods. Right? In that case, we will be able to, uh, for instance, if we want the spectrum, we could have the, the molecule that we want to excite uh, as active, and then we can have other molecules outside that are treated at a lower, uh, lower level of, of accuracy. And uh, then in this way, the, the, the calculations can be made feasible. So this is perfectly in, in line with what we want to do with the multi-level functionality. Okay. All right. So if we don't have any more questions, let's thank Professor, Professor Coach once again for a nice talk. And thank before you. we thank finish, so before we finish, I'm going to share uh, a screen for one last announcement.
So again, I just want to say that we still plan on having a webinar next week, March 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, the webinar details are still being figured out, but as soon as they come out, we'll let you know. All right, so again, thank you so much for attending and have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye-bye.